Um, thank you so much for having me. And uh, um, yeah, kudos to the fantastic talks I've, I've heard already. That was real fun. Um, I heard a lot of uh, technical terminology that I'm going to use. So I guess my first few slides are going to be preaching to the choir, and then we'll get slightly more technical. Um, if I want to, if you wanted to just remember this talk by one thing, and it, it would be that because of the availability of knowledge graphs really through a semantic media wiki and other forms of wikis out there, we now have the possibility to actually learn directly on knowledge graphs at web scale and have explainable machine learning for really low amounts of resources. And what I want to talk about is really give you an overview of how we do that. I'm not going to delve too much into technical details. I am going to skip some technical details actually. Um, but I'll be more than happy to answer questions pertaining to those details and delve into them as needed. So without any further ado, let's start. So really, okay, interesting. Apologies for that. My PDF seems to be blank. That's odd. Just a second. I guess I have to restart my PDF. I apologize. Uh, why are you doing that? I tested it like a second ago and it worked. So it's just a matter of uh, having the wrong piece of software opening the software PDF, I'm afraid. Yes. It's, uh... So let's try this again. There we go. Okay. Uh, can you see this? Can you see the presentation? That should work now. Okay, fantastic. Sorry, I don't know. Basically, Adobe just crashed on me. So foundationally, um, knowledge graphs are now everywhere that are used in a plethora of different applications. I think the most commonly known application is web search. So if you look for an entity using the Google search engine, for example, you get this little box on the right-hand side, which is really nothing else than a view, a partial view of the Google knowledge graph, but it's not the only area where knowledge graphs are being used. Um, they are used, for example, in biomedicine, um, for the prediction of uh, medical substances or of active compounds. We've probably heard of um, the discovery of compounds such as halicin, really based on graph structures. Um, in the financial domain, knowledge graphs are used to compile information, for example, about competition and track entities across the web so as to be able to predict how entities are going to behave, for example, what their, what their next financial moves are going to be. Now, some of the most popular knowledge graphs out there really come from Wiki. So this is a tip of the hat to um, the semantic media Wiki and other types of Wikis which have been used to manage uh, very large knowledge graphs, for example, Wikidata, um, but also knowledge graphs such as Wikipedia, which have been extracted really out of information which is managed using uh, um, a media Wiki. So basically Wiki like structure, freebies is another one of those, which is really the foundation for the Google knowledge graph. And obviously because these data structures or this family of data structures um, is getting more and more popular, there is obviously the question, how do we use that in machine learning? So there have been a number of advances, hence, on learning on graphs. For example, I think the most prominent is really geometric deep learning. Geometric deep learning is really a branch and arts approach towards um, generalizing over different types of graph learning algorithms which have been developed in the past, such as convolutional and attentional neural, graph neural networks. They're really showing that these are all just different facets of the same thing, so really of message passing neural networks. Um, but these graph approaches, so geometric, such as geometric deep learning, the ones subsumed by geometric deep learning, have the same problem that you have if you're running something like, um, a deep learning algorithm, there really are deep learning algorithms um, 
on text. And the problem is simply that they are not explainable. Those are black box algorithms. You basically shove, shove vectors around and you get vectors of which you are allowed to characterize single nodes or interactions between nodes or even whole graphs. But the meaning of these vectors obviously remains obscure. There is another family of uh, machine learning algorithms out there, which is what I'm going to be uh, talking about today, which are class expression learning algorithms. And they have the major advantage that they really are able to use the semantics of the knowledge graph while learning and hence present explainable results. Now, um, the major downfall of those algorithms so far has simply been that these algorithms were not explainable and they were not scalable in contrast to existing algorithms such as geometric deep learning algorithms, which are regarded at least as being scalable, although even they sometimes fail on, on very large graphs. So um, the reason why we want explainability, so the reason why we want to not have just vectors, but actually explainable concepts, it's simply because explainability has been shown to be central for the acceptance of machine learning algorithms. So as the talk before said, trusted sources are important for actually accepting the results of machine learning algorithms. Another, uh, in, in domains where one deals with knowledge workers, ergo with domain experts, it is central for them to actually understand how a machine learning algorithm came about with the predictions that it returns. So that's the reason why we are particularly interested in developing explainable machine learning algorithms for knowledge graphs. And what do I mean by explainable here? Obviously, I'm not going to try to cover all different aspects of explainability. What I really mean is that we want the machine learning model, which is computed to be computed it can be translated into natural language, which is understandable by a domain expert. So um, I cannot see the audience, but I'm still going to try this experiment. So if you were to imagine that this knowledge graph were all the data that was given to you, and you were told um, you have a bunch of positive examples here, which are Louvre, which is basically um, this node over here, and Tour Eiffel, these are my positive examples, and my negative examples are Lily and James. Which expression, which natural language expression which would describe the positive examples and not describe the negative examples? I don't know whether I'm going to hear you, but you can try to shout it out and see whether I can hear that. So I don't know what the answer is, or I cannot hear what you're saying. But um, basically, what most people come up with in this case is things located in Paris, right? So that's a natural language expression and it really describes the positive examples we have here without describing the negative examples. We can also go for things located somewhere. So this is really the type of machine learning that we want to have. We want to really exploit the fact that we have knowledge graphs which are understandable and actually develop scalable machine learning on top, uh, algorithms on top of knowledge graphs which return class expressions, which we can transform into natural language. And what I want to talk about is really a few um, improvements which have been made over the last few years to actually accelerate this type of learning process. So what are the challenges that we face with and why did we need new learning processes? Well, it's no challenge number one is simply that real knowledge graphs are large or being are growing really over time. What you see here is obviously the growth of the linked open data cloud. But if you were to look at single points in that linked open data cloud, so as single data sets, you'll actually find that the size of data sets as well is growing. If you think about the Google Knowledge Graph, for example, we are talking about roughly 1 billion things that are described and roughly 70 billion statements. Um, the second challenge that we're faced with is actually that uh, real knowledge graphs are also inconsistent. Inconsistent, what we mean by that is simply that they contain statements which are such that there is no model really for those knowledge graphs. For example, things like the height of Myron Jones uh, in one version or in one page on the Wikipedia, hence in the DBpedia, uh, it is stated to be 1 meter 52 4. Another one is one meter seventy seven eight, or the birthplace of Colin Douglas is uh, California and Florida, and so on and so forth. 
And the third problem that we're faced with when we want to do machine learning, explainable machine learning uh, on knowledge graphs is that real knowledge graphs are commonly incomplete. So my favorite uh, tidbit here being that whilst the birthplace and the country of birth of Barack Obama mentioned in um, a version of DBpedia, so I think it's DBpedia 2016-10, the nationality is not mentioned, although it is pretty clear that he's also American as, as a, a nationality, he was born there, he grew up there, and so on and so forth. So there, of course, um, that's a challenge that we have to deal with when we are doing machine learning on knowledge graphs. Um, I will not get into all the details of how we solve these challenges. As I said, I want to give you an overview of how, of how current algorithms work and that perform uh, to a level where we can actually use them at scale. So going back to our, to our example, we will assume that we are given this graph. We are given a set of positive examples and a set of negative examples. So we're looking at a supervised machine learning problem. And our job is really to learn class expressions. So you remember the example I showed you before where I said, um, Lou went to a film, our positive examples, Lily and James are negative examples. What we want to learn are really class expressions for the, Description logic aficionados will uh, mostly be dealing with ALC, although this algorithm can be extended to Schroik um, or basically out to DL. Um, yes, the what we are trying to learn are class expressions that are rich in this hypothesis. So we want to basically be able to generate such expressions such as um, this class expression, things that are located in a place is basically an expression such that Louvre and Toefel ergo the positive examples are instances of that expression, whilst the negative examples are not. So that's foundationally our goal here. Or things located in Paris would be another class expression which would fit the bill here, describe the positive examples and not describe the negative examples. The way this was commonly done in uh, up to a few years ago was really using refinement operators. And the idea behind the refinement operator is actually pretty straightforward. We will start with the top concept, the concept which describes everything. So basically we'd say everything, every instance found in a knowledge graph might be a solution. Then the job of the refinement operator is to generate concepts which are such that, or a set of concepts, which is such that every concept in that set is subsumed by the node which was refined. So if I were to refine the top concept here, I will get a bunch of concepts. That's the second layer. And these concepts which be such that they are subsumed by top. For example, I will get the concept exists is located in top. And the job or the way the algorithm would then work is try to find the best current solution. For example, exists is located in and refine it further until the solution that it gets meets certain criteria, for example, achieves an F measure of one. In this case, this is already done here, but one could try to find, for example, the more specific solution that one could refine further. Okay, the problem with this approach is simply that it demands quite a few steps, which are rather expensive, which I want to show you in the next slide. So if you take it from a conceptual perspective, we would start with training data, positive and negative examples, and a knowledge base. Then uh, in our next step, an, a candidate solution, which would be top. In our next step, we would basically ask a quality function to tell us how good our candidate solutions are. In this case, it would only be top. So the candidates, the quality function will have to be run on top. But the way we run the quality function really is by asking a retrieval function to actually get us all the instances of the concept which we are currently considering. So if we take top, for example, we mean retrieval or retrieving all the things which are in our knowledge graph. Or if we take the concept we had before, things that are located somewhere, it would basically mean returning the set of all things which have a location. Based on the retrieval function, the quality function cannot tell us how good our solution is. We would then use this quality function to score the current solutions that we have, and then use a the results of this candidate generation to actually pinpoint the next candidate which we are going to run our refinement operation on top of. So basically, this is nothing else than a directed search, but it turns out that computing that um, running the retrieval function is usually very expensive. This is roughly 90% of the runtimes 
of a traditional approach towards class expression learning on large scale knowledge graphs. Uh, running the quality function is eh, usually is, uh, cheaper, but we'll find that existing quality functions were actually pretty flawed. So this is a challenge that we're faced with. We want to basically be able to run, first of all, this algorithm or uh, alternative algorithms, but at a way lower cost so that we can run explainable machine learning on knowledge graphs within acceptable times. So um, the first problem that we obviously need to solve is how do we make retrieval more, more um, time efficient um, as it is basically the step which is the most expensive. Um, and it turns out that retrieval in common description logics can be realized simply by representing concepts as sparkle queries. That runs obviously under certain conditions. We assume that the graph is fully materialized and that we are dealing with, we are using the closed world assumption. But under these assumptions, we can actually do the following. We can map every class expression. So every name class can simply be mapped to a graph pattern of the form a variable RDF type A. So if A is a name class, then this class expression will return exactly the same thing as running the retrieval function on A. For the negation is also pretty obvious. We just need to filter um, all the things which are of type C and everything that is not of type C, we can return. That would that also so does the trick. Conjunction and disjunction are pretty obvious. Those are also simply fragments of Sparkle queries, which we can use. So for the conjunction, we simply use the conjunction as in Sparkle and for union, we also do have union in Sparkle. What is um, also simple to actually compute is existentials. So exist RC simply uh, looking, returning all things which are um, connected via R to the our target variable uh, while ensuring that this S is of type C, problem solved. Um, the one that is slightly more complicated is really for all RC. That is if you want to obviously map ALC semantics or basically the description logic ALC to Sparkle queries. Um, and what we need to do is either fetch for things which are not connected to anything of type C via R, or ensure that if we have a connection of a variable via R to something, then basically every S, to be the number of things which are connected to a variable via R is exactly equal to the number of things that are of type C and are connected to our variable via R. So basically what this really means is there is a bridge between instantiation of, of between, between the retrieval function in um, description logic and really Sparkle query under certain conditions. And this is the concrete bridge for ALC, which can be extended to other description logics. Now, the question is now how to run this fast. And it turns out, and I'm not going to go into all the technical details, but it turns out really that these Sparkle queries can be represented as Einstein summation on tensor representations of knowledge graphs. So just to give you an idea of how this works, if we were to end up really with this Sparkle query of this type, which we needed to execute, it turns out that each of these uh, triple patterns is really nothing else than a slicing operation on a tensor. So you can imagine that our knowledge graph, um, which is SPO is now represented as a tensor where the first dimension is the subjects, the second dimension is the predicates and the third dimension is the objects. Then really computing E1 fourth nose F is nothing else than taking the slice of, the, of this three dimensional tensor uh, where we only have the third variable being unbound E1 maps to one and fourth nodes maps to two. And we can do the same for the other basic graph patterns. And now to combine this, so basically really to compute a join, all we really need to do is run an Einstein summation. No need to get into the details. The important bit is here, we can take concepts in description logics, we can map them to Sparkle queries, and by using really tensor operations, which are, um, known from standard AI libraries. So if you were to use uh, PyTorch, for example, you'll find that you have a nice transformation there where you can implement these kind of things. We can actually run the retrieval operation very efficiently. And it turns out that 
um, by running the retrieval operation this way, we outperform the state of the art quite significantly. Um, there are two papers on the subject matter, uh, which are a paper called Tentris and another one called on the on compressing the hypertry, where you can get more details on the subject matter. But what was important here it was just to say, hey, by doing this buckle bridge, we can solve this retrieval problem. What is more important is really how we solve the learning in of itself. And what I want to point out here is that we can really regard the problem of class expression learning as being a deep Q learning problem. So basically uh, as a reinforcement learning problem. So the way previous algorithms would compute the quality of a concept uh, would be as follows. We would assume that we have RC be the set of all the instances of CC being the concept for which we uh, actually need to want to compute the quality and C prime uh, being the parent concept of C in the search tree, the accuracy of a concept of our concept C would really be measured as checking how many of the positive examples it covers, how many of the negative examples it covers, and actually wanting to cover as many positive examples as possible while not covering any of the negative examples, right? So if that's the case, ideally, then we get an accuracy of one. The accuracy gain would be nothing else than the difference between the accuracy of the concept and the accuracy of the parent concept in the search tree, which I showed you before. And we would then combine these two, so the accuracy of the concept and the accuracy gain, to actually give it the quality score. Now, if you think about this from the perspective of uh, game playing, for example, it would mean that if one is playing a game of chess where one only looks at the current board situation and past board situations, but does not really compute what future board situations could look like to actually determine which uh, move one wants to make. And obviously, uh, such approaches, which are called myopic approaches in reinforcement learning, are suboptimal when it comes to actually um, traversing search trees in an informed manner. So um, it turns out we can do better by mapping the reinforcement learning problem, of oh, my apologies, the class expression learning problem to a reinforcement learning problem. Um, it's actually pretty straightforward how to do that. All we need to do is really to see that the states of the reinforcement learning problem are the concepts. Our reward function is one if the accuracy is one. So if we found a solution, we set the reward to one, else we set the reward to zero. And all we do is basically transitioning from concepts to concepts, we set that as being our action. So really applying the refinement operator is gives us the action space in which we are. And with that, we have a one-to-one -one mapping between class expression learning and reinforcement learning, but we know how to basically uh, run reinforcement learning really efficiently. Alpha zero and the like have shown us how to do that. We can really say, I'm gonna skip the technical details, but really what's important here is we can really say this is nothing else than uh, trying to optimize a state action value function where really the action, so the actions are non-probabilistic, which means we're actually looking at state state transition functions. And we can obviously learn um, a neural network, which is good, which basically does nothing else than predicting um, state state transition functions and hence basically determine the right way to traverse the tree or search tree. Um, for the sake of time, how much time do I have left? I think roughly five minutes. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip this and uh, really just say, what the beauty of this uh, whole subject is really that uh, we can train our deep Q network really in an unsupervised manner. So basically in a self-supervised manner to be technically correct, simply because, because we have a refinement operator, we can actually generate training problems automatically once given the knowledge graph in the back end. All we really need to do is to apply our refinement operator randomly until we get to a class expression, which we want to learn. Imagine that we're the class expression down here, we can then apply ret the retrieval function, which we've discussed before, such that we get positive and negative examples. We have our target concept, we have our positive examples, we have our negative examples, so we actually know how to score um, the different concepts in the tree. And with that, we can act we actually have training data with which we can score such a Q network. What is fascinating about this approach is that um, it's not only that it achieves better F measures and accuracies than, than the state of the art, 
it's also that it reduces the run times quite significantly um, while also partially traversing less expression. So basically have a better directed search through the search tree. So that is really how to transition from the normal class expression learning, which did not scale, to class expression learning, which scales better, ergo, which is faster traversing the search tree. The question that we asked ourselves, and I'm going to basically keep this one short, is can we do any better than that? So can we actually have constant time answers on knowledge graphs when we're doing class expression learning? Um, the answer is yes, we lose the tree, so we don't know really how the concept uh, is computed, but we can actually look at the problem in a different way. And that is really rethink the problem of class expression learning as being a machine translation problem. And if we do so, it turns out that we can take the positive and negative examples, put them into an embedding algorithm, and basically get embedding vectors for each of the entities in a positive and negative examples, and really then map this problem to a problem of take or map the class expression learning problem to a problem of given a set of positive and a set of negative embedding vectors generate an expression in that in natural language or basically in the target language or target language here being a description logic which actually describes the positive examples without describing the negative examples and we can reuse everything that we've seen before for training such a method and um, it turns out, and this is where results get rather really interesting, that um, Gator recurrent units perform really well at this task, uh, as well as set transformers, although they do not have the invariance built in which set transformers do. That's one. But most importantly, um, it's not only that we get better F measures, especially when the data sets get large. This is the slide that is the most important. Um, we really get pretty much constant run times on the class expression learning problem independently of the data set. So on the standard data sets, we get on average two orders of magnitude up to four order of magnitudes. Um, but the last, if we ever growing uh, data sets, we get a, per, a constant answer time of roughly somewhere between 0 0.1 and 0 0.3 seconds on the data at hand. Okay, so let me sum up. This was really compact, but what I really wanted to talk about is the fact that um, with Semantic Media Wiki and other wikis which look at data not from a textual perspective, but more from a structural perspective, we actually open the door for new families of machine learning algorithms. And these machine learning algorithms have the main advantage of being intrinsically explainable. Um, and class expression learning um, is one of these families of algorithms. What we learn here are class expressions. These class expressions can be transformed into natural language. So instead of having basically a black box, we through basically having structured data, we can get white box algorithms for the data at hand. Um, and what I wanted to point out as well is really that over the last few years, there have been improvements on the runtimes of those white box algorithms, which actually make them such that they can be used in real life environments, which was not the case a few years ago, simply due to scalability issues. Um, there is, however, a trade-off between runtime and transparency. So if you want algorithms which are really fast, we actually lose transparency. We don't know how the um, class expressions come about, but we do have class expressions. Um, if you do want how to, a full explanation of how the uh, class expressions come about, we actually lose some runtime. So that's basically the trade-off one has to live with in this space. There are, however, still a bunch of open questions. So what I have pointed out here really is how we did it. It's not necessarily the only way to do it to basically get to class expressions. And uh, this is a well-known problem. Machine learning architectures can be very different and lead to the same results. Um, there is still the open question of how do we go beyond so to the meta level of class expression learning or really uh, white box learning or knowledge graphs and uh, what auto ML, so automated machine learning approaches for such algorithms would look like. Um, but the um, questions which I'm, or the question which I'm most interested in at the moment really is another one. So the trick that we used really was to go from 
tensors to embeddings to be able to actually represent the different stages of the machine learning pipeline. But that was designed by humans. And what we are particularly interested in these days is asking the question, how do we actually automatically select representations and can actually humans help selecting the right representations for the different machine learning problems that come about with structured data. That sums it up already. And I'll be more than happy to answer questions if there are any.